and welcome back to our second class as we continue our journey about spiritual discipleship. In our first lesson, we talked about the definition of disciple. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple maker? Is Jesus still in the business of discipling? And so in case you missed that lesson, make sure you go and check that out once again. But one thing that we talked about in the class was when does a person become a disciple? Because there are many church models that point discipleship as the 10th thing that you have to do. So first you become a believer and then you're a congregant and then you're sold out, you know, like you want to follow Jesus forever. And then you become a disciple. But biblically, as we look at the scriptures, is that discipleship and salvation are two sides of the same coin. So the day that you come to know Christ and you say, I desire for you to be in my heart, I desire for you to be my Lord and my master, is the same day that you choose to become a disciple. Because as we talked about, the definition is that a disciple is a student, a learner, an apprentice in relationship to the teacher. Now look at this quote right here. It's pretty alarming. Today, one is regarded as a Christian, even if there are few, if any, signs of profess in discipleship. It was not so in the early church. Then discipleship involved the kind of commitment Peter spoke about when he protested to the Lord, we have left everything to follow you. Our focus tonight will be on human discipleship relationships. And I'm going to build an argument and place the responsibility on you and on me because the cost of not making disciples is huge. And how we can practically take steps, just two small steps, to start making disciples today. Are you excited? I am too. So let's continue on. God calls us all to discipleship. Look about, think about it real quick. God calls you right now, no matter how old you are, no matter how many degrees you have on the wall, no matter how much you know of the Bible, God calls you into discipleship today. And that discipleship can be between you and Jesus and or you and another human being who will walk alongside you, continue to encourage you, keep you accountable, points you to Jesus over and over again. Not only does God call us to be disciples, but as we see in Matthew 28, God requires us to go and make disciples. Look at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. Now we're just focusing on the first part of the Great Commission to go and make disciples. I shared this in a sermon recently. Check it out real quick. (laughs) So as you look at the word go, the, the, the Greek word for go, do you know what the Greek word for go means? It means go, right? Great job, scholars, right? Go because the Lord has ordered them to go. That is the reason why they're about to go on this great commission, because their master said, go. They were going because he promised to impart all the strength that they needed for this journey. He said, go. He said, go because he is worthy of homage, faith, and obedience from all humankind. But then he gave a command. He said this, go and make disciples. This is big right here, church. Go and make disciples disciples. He didn't say go and add people to the club of church. He didn't say come and and go in and tell people why they're rude and tell them to clean up their language and then make you feel comfortable. No, he said go and make disciples. Now, if I can geek out with you again, the thing is, this is Jesus talking. Jesus wasn't no hippie. He wasn't like, hey, peace, love y'all. Like, please go make disciples. Like in the Greek, this is called an imperative. Oh, y'all, like think about your mama real quick, right? Like if your mama tell you, go clean up your room, that's an imperative. That means go clean up your room, right? Now for you movie scholars here, have you ever seen the movie Predator 
We'll pray for you. Okay, but like I remember when I saw Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, in case you've never seen it, it's Arnold, right? And so what happened, he was going against an alien and he was protecting this one lady and they finally sent a chopper to come and pick up him and the lady. And it's the climax of the movie where this alien is like, his face like, kind of like that, right? And he has all the, the, the missiles and stuff like that. And, and, and Arnold says, Go get to the chopper. Do you remember? Do you remember that? This is a get to the chopper moment. Get to the chopper and make disciples. Okay, I got to stop. I got to pull back. I got to pull back. That's what I want you to think of when you think of imperative. Jesus didn't say, please go make disciples. Get to the chopper. Okay. I know. It can be pretty funny, right? We can have some fun with Bible study. But the thing is, God gives us a command to go and make disciples right now. Now, in the rendering of this Greek right here, it's very important to notice that the Greek word that was used doesn't mean to be to make disciples by force. L- look at this quote. In rendering this Greek word in Matthew 28, 19, a s- and similar context, it is important to avoid the implication of duress or force. That is to say, one should not translate force them to be my disciples or compel them to be my disciples in order to avoid a wrong implication of a causative. It may be important to use such expression as convince them to become my disciples or urge them to become my disciples. So once again, the idea is, yes, God has given us the responsibility to go and make disciples, go and make students and learners, but not by force, not by shame, not by condemnation, but to urge them, to show them, to give them a bigger picture, to help them understand the gospel, to help them understand the cost if they don't become discipled. And that's on our part. And I love this one quote, and I forgot who said it, so I'll take credit. You can only take someone as far as you've been. And if I can ask you an honest question is, who is Jesus to you? Is he a person worthy to be followed? Is he a person who can actually impact our lives today? Are his teachings still relevant? Are his teachings still piercing the heart? And if it's not doing it for you, what makes you think you can do that for somebody else? That's why we have to engage with the word of God. We have to engage with the presence of God that we can bring so many more people alongside us, side by side, and saying, oh, I've been there too. Let me help you how God has walked me through this. But here's another question for you to chew on. What does it cost to be a disciple? Now, as I asked the class this, I asked them to form a group, and I want them to come to to a realization or to a list and compile this list to say, what does it cost to actually be a disciple? Like, does it cost money? Does it cost time? Does it cost comfort? What does it cost? And it was awesome. Like our, our class really chewed on this and they came up with an amazing list. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Exercised, uh, set apart, the cost of relationships, and we said family, friends, co-workers, etc. Uh, rejection and judgments that are placed on us. Um, possibly a job if we're really, if we're really... <laughs> Money. We... Was that sign language? <laughs> <laughs> like professional raver? <laughs> Uh, money, we talked about, the, you know, like starting to do the things that we were asked to do, which is tithe and take people out for ice cream. <laughs> right? <laughs> theology, yeah. And then freedoms, you know, because as we disciple, we, you know, maybe ladies night or going to a work party versus going to a, wor- you know, worship night, things like that. We lose some freedoms, so. Okay. All right. You lose some freedoms by going to worship night? No, you lose some freedoms like not being able to go to ladies night or something, you know, because it's church night or something. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Freedoms. A yes in one area is a no in another area. Yes. A yes. There's so much cost when it comes to following Jesus. 
And that's why when we come to Jesus and we put our faith in Jesus, it shouldn't be a whimsical idea or just an off the cuff idea, because what's going to happen is you're going to go home and you're going to see what the cost actually is. And that's where a lot of people walk away. But I want you to look at Luke chapter 14 and verses 25 through 33. And it says this. Now, great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and comes after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. What king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is something that's not preached a lot in church. Because a lot, a lot of times in church, we hear the practical wisdom and we hear some good stuff that's encouraging. Yeah, let's go. But the thing is, as we just read what Jesus said, there is an actual cost to following Jesus. This cost is a cost of comfort. This cost is something that you have to ha you actually have to sit down and think about. Like I know how it's sold sometimes that heaven is the end goal. Like it's worth it for heaven. But Jesus says, no, 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 I'm not selling you heaven. I'm selling you the abundant life. I'm showing you how you can live this abundant life, how you can follow me every single day, how you can be empowered by me to go and proclaim the gospel throughout the highways and the byways, throughout the whole entire earth. I'm showing you how to live with purpose. I'm showing you how to live with a brand new identity. And this is going to cost you. Because what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit ministers to us and shows us who we truly are. As what Scripture says, Scripture is a mirror. Scripture is a light that exposes the darkness and the weakness. Like, Are we ready to see that? Are we ready to hear areas where we're wrong? Are we ready to hear truth that we don't want to hear yet? Like forgive your neighbor. Well, what about this one? Love your enemy. I don't know about you, but I know sometimes I struggle with that one. And that's why Jesus says, count the cost because the life I'm calling to you to. It's amazing. And it brings freedom. It brings purpose. But you have to be willing to lay down your pride. And in these verses that we just shared about, because I know some of you might be like, oh, man, I had to hate my mom and dad. Like, What the idea is, what Jesus was teaching us is of priority. He says, I have to be number one in your life. And if I can't be number one in your life, you can't be my disciple. Because once again, that cost. There might be a parent or uh, a loved one in your life that doesn't want Jesus and they're going to pull you away. And Jesus says, but if you want to follow me and if you want to learn from me, you have to make me number one. Look at this. Though costly, discipleship, once had a very clear, straightforward meaning. The mechanics are not the same today. We cannot literally be with them in the same way as the first disciples could. But the priorities and intentions, the heart and inner attitudes of disciples are forever the same. In the heart of a disciple, there is a desire and there is a decision or settled intent having come to some understanding of what it means and thus having counted up the cost, the disciple of Christ desires above all else to be like him. Thus, it is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher. And moreover, everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Just to remind you of our first lesson, 
That was the goal and intention of, the, of rabbis back in the day. They had the idea of, I believe you can do what I can do, therefore follow me. And so that student, that disciple, that pupil understood that there was intentionality between the rabbi and the student that this rabbi was building his replacement. This rabbi was building his legacy. And so for us as disciples, though it's been watered down horribly, the meaning and intention of Jesus is still the same. And even for us as disciple makers who we're investing in, the time, the commitment, and all that, we're not making a mini you or a mini me or a mini miniature-sized version of whoever. The goal is always to make people more like Christ, more like Jesus. So here's your second question of the night is, is this. What is the cost of non-discipleship? Go ahead. Think about it. Okay. okay. So now we're going to go. To, what is the cost of non-discipleship? So cost of non-discipleship, loss of integrity, abuse of grace. So I'll just park on that one for a second. If we have been afforded the grace, but we're not extending the grace, that's an abuse of the grace that we have. Attrition. So loss of people. Now, turnover would be, if you're lucky, that new people are coming in. So, you know, those two are, are similar, but attrition, no one's coming in. You're just losing people. The loss of quality, so the quality of believers. Uh, stagnation, so even the people within the church can also not be growing as well as the people coming in. They're babies forever, always on milk. And then those who think they're growing might be a little bit more moralistic and more action oriented and less living it out, right? Because they're not, at that point, they're not. They're either in delayed obedience or disobedience. Um, heresy. So if you're not growing someone, you're not growing yourself. Because um, as Brian pointed out, when you're discipling, you are also being discipled yourself um, as you're growing someone else. So heresy has room to move in places where you're not growing. Like you don't spit out the bones, right? <laughs> Loss of focus as far as the church Ooh. and individually. So the church can start to lose focus. Loss of passion. That's also individual as well as for the church as a whole. Uh, lack of accountability. Mm. Again, we're not accountable because no one's holding us, especially when you're discipling someone and you're bringing someone up, they're going to ask you questions that hold you accountable. Like, are you actually living that out? You know, so you lose that accountability. Lack of discipline for uh, very similar reasons. Um, no foundation. So when we're talking about the mission, vision, values of a church, if you're not discipling people, you're not really living out your mission, vision, values. There's really nothing there. So that's kind of a hypocrisy, which I didn't write down, but we talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we said moralistic. Moralistic is like the Pharisees. So that sin, which I think we all carry as Christians anyway, but we can tend toward moralistic. I'm doing, but I'm not in relationship because we have no one holding us accountable. So we're doing, 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 and there's nothing to kind of counterbalance that in relational. Am I going too long? Ladies night. Hey. Right? Guys night out. You're kind of missing that. And again, it's delayed obedience or disobedience. So if Jesus has asked us to do that, then we are to do that, right? I mean, it's kind of that simple. It's good. See, that's yeah. simple. Look at this quote. It says this, non-discipleship costs abiding peace, a life penetrated throughout by love, faith that sees everything in the light of God's overriding governance for good, hopefulness that stands firm in the most discouraging of circumstances power to do what is right and withstand the forces of evil in short non-discipleship costs you exactly the abundance of life jesus said he came to bring the cross-shaped yoke of christ 
is after all an instrument of liberation and power to those who live it with him and learn the meekness and lowliness of heart that brings rest to the soul. So here's another question for you. After we hear that, that description of non-discipleship and what it actually costs, let me add a little caveat to that. What's the cost of non-discipleship? Yes, dysfunction, I would agree with that. But also, that would include marriages. Where we're instructed by the word to love our wives as Christ loves the church, and we can try to guess, and we can try to say, okay, I guess it's a bullet down to five things. We can try to do that, but like to really fully understand the heart of Christ in loving a church, the people that are dysfunctional, sometimes we're mean, we're disloyal, we're liars sometimes. We are all about ourselves sometimes, we're self-seeking, we're selfish sometimes. I don't know if I'm just writing myself out or if I'm talking to you too. But yet, even though we're all these things, Christ loves us immensely that is beyond comprehension. And we husbands are called to love our wives in such a similar fashion. Shouldn't we ask the one who can love the unlovable, who can love the unforgivable, who can love us and say, God, how do I love my wife? How do I cherish her? How do I respect her? How do I love her? Even though, and you give them a laundry list and vice versa for wives to submit, to, to love, to, to come alongside your husband. Sometimes you're going to need to depend on Jesus and say, Jesus, how do you have the patience? Jesus, I feel like saying A, B, and C. Like, how do you have self-control? Like, Jesus, I feel like doing stuff. You know, kind of like that, right? But to turn to Jesus, because the cost of non-discipleship leaves that husband and that wife to figure it out on their own. And that's why it might be a contributing factor to 50% of marriages ending in divorce. I know that's a hard saying to say, but like, can we take some time to think about that? And challenge that? Because if it's true, how much more do we need discipleship in our lives and in our churches, especially in our marriages? So that's just one example, once again, of the cost of non-discipleship. How it impacts one's personal life, but also in relationship with everybody else. So here's another question for you. At the cost of both discipleship and non-discipleship, there's a cost. Which cost is greater? Because once again, if you made your own list of the cost to be discipled by Jesus or discipled by somebody else, the cost is usually surfacey, if, if not a little bit greater. It's going to cost your time, your talent, your treasure, your, your, your schedule, right? It's going to cost you your pride, you know, all these things, but all these things are going to make you better. Whereas the cost of non discipleship, it costs you comfort. Well, in the sense, like you, you get that enjoy comfort for the time being, but you still are in the darkness and you're still walking and limping around. It's kind of like this. If you went to a gym and you, you looked at the weights and you're like, oh, this is great. Like, that's awesome. And you try to figure out the weights and then and, and you get this dumbbell and you're like, I guess I, I use it with my toes or something. Like you're trying to take your best guess. Like you have all this access to all this weight here that can help you be healthy and stronger and all that. But you don't know how to use it because no one's shown you. So what would be helpful is if you got a personal trainer that would help you. So what's the cost of a trainer? It costs you financially, costs you physically, it costs you, you know, your comfort and all that. But is it worth it to be healthy and to stronger and, and to use those tools correctly? Because the cost right here might be injury. It might be more money to go to the doctors like, I dropped it on my toe. You know, like, but also ultimately the cost of non-discipleship is that you are still unhealthy and you are still overweight. You are still underweight, you know, all that. Or once again, if you had that trainer you'd be stronger. So if you weigh it out, what costs more? I'm hoping I'm leading you to say non-discipleship costs more and it's not good. So if we can agree that we're commanded by Jesus to go and make disciples and we can agree that there are consequences for obedience and disobedience 
in making disciples or not making disciples, how do we go and make disciples? So here's a question I need you to chew on and think about. Ready? What would be your plan to disciple someone? Would it be structured or free? Would it be based on curriculum or go with the flow? And how long would you commit to it? Think about it. Now, a lot of our students responded and they're like, oh man, I would want to meet with the student. I would want to meet with the disciple and say, what's your goal? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? Kind of like a life coach a little bit. And then you had other ones that would say, I would stick directly to curriculum. I would say, I'll take the 12 steps and do this and do that. Some people are like, I'll start in Genesis. I'll start in the book of John. You know, and, and, and some students said, I would start in certain books of the Bible that are really important and that they need to have a strong foundation biblically. So a lot of our students really looked at the intellectual part or really trying to customize, customize the discipleship to that person's life. But look at this. Look at this quote. It says this. In reality, the responsibility for spiritual growth never rests on the disciple maker alone. We often tell people that there are three parts to the discipleship process. There is my part, the disciple maker, their part, and the Lord's part. I can't do their part, and I cannot do the Lord's part. I am only responsible for my part. So as a disciple maker, be encouraged and know to be obedient to make someone and to encourage someone to become more like Christ. You have a responsibility to study. You have a responsibility to ask the hard questions. You have a responsibility to hold that person accountable. But you are not responsible for the fruit. If that person chooses to walk away or if that person chooses to say, this is too hard, if that person chooses to say, you know, whatever it may be, and they just walk away and they give up, that's not on you because your goal and your job, your responsibility is to be obedient because God is doing his part. He'll speak through his word. His presence is with you and he'll guide you and he'll lead you. Now, for some of you, you might be wondering, how do I even start taking a step towards discipling someone? Like, like what should be the goal? Like, do I just go to church and find someone like, do you want to be discipled? Like, you could do that. That'd be a little weird and all that. But I'm going to argue this, that your first step should be the step that Jesus modeled. So let's talk about it. Jesus' methodology included focusing specifically on 12 men. Think about that real quick. Like Jesus didn't start with 500 people and they met every week. Just imagine that though. Like if he would have done that, do you think that the impact on this world would have been greater? Because he started with 12 men. And as we see in the book of Acts, these 12 men turned the world upside down, minus Judas. But you, you can see that Jesus had such a great impact, even with a small group. And he sent them to go make disciples, multiplying his influence and his teachings. So why not disciple more and get more in return investment? Once again, right? Our argument is that Jesus did not want to have fickle people join him to be his disciple and to be a student. He was able to focus on 12 people that were sold out saying, I'm 100% in Jesus no matter what. And, and he had access to him. The, the 12 to 1 ratio of, of teacher to students right there, that they were able to be tested. They were able to be invested in. They're able to have focus right there on Jesus. Look at this quote. Disciples cannot be mass produced, but are the product of intimate and personal investment. The careful, painstaking education of the disciples secured that their teacher's influence on the world should be permanent that his kingdom should be founded on deep and indestructible convictions in the minds of a few, not on the shifting sands of superficial impressions on the minds of many. Now, as we continue to look through scripture, we, we see how other disciple makers went about making disciples, and one in particular was Paul. Paul, once again, could have discipled the masses, being so smart and so charismatic and so influential, but Paul decided to meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, to love on people, to invest in people so much that he used familial language, calling people his sons and his daughters, 
his spiritual sons and his spiritual daughters. And so I would argue that Paul and Jesus used three of the main ingredients to making disciples. Number one, they both used relational vulnerability. What does that mean? Relational vulnerability means to be honest, self-disclosing and confessional relationships that give the Holy Spirit permission to remake us. Paul would talk about that thorn in the flesh. Paul would talk about his discouragements. Paul would talk about, you know, his scourgings and those that would persecute him. He was vulnerable. You know, he didn't just say, you know, just another hard day at work. No, he was like, man, this was hard. But Jesus, Jesus used this relational vulnerability by loving on his disciples and and calling them close to, to pray and to weep. You remember the the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He allowed his disciples to witness that and to learn from it that it was okay to weep and mourn and to grieve rather than keeping up a fake facade of spiritual religiosity that shows you to being holier than thou and and putting up a strong front when you're inside, you're, you're broken. Jesus wept. Jesus cared. Jesus loved. He was vulnerable. Number two is centrality of truth. This is emphasized when people open their lives to one another around the truth of God's word, and the Lord begins to rebuild their lives from the inside out. We're going to read in a couple minutes about how Jesus would reach to the sinners of that time, the marginalized people, those that would never go to synagogue because of their sin or their issues. But the thing is, as Jesus would build relationship with them, allow them to belong, Jesus didn't allow them to just have the agenda and lead what was being talked about. No, Jesus would always focus them back to the truth. Jesus would always share like, hey, here's the truth and here's why I'm building a relationship with you. Paul, as you see in his writings, man, he was like saturated with the truth. He loved relationship, but also he wanted people once again to be in union with God, to have Christ-like character. So for us as disciple makers, The truth has to be foundational. And I think that there is a big difference between the truth and just practical advice. Practical advice would say, well, in my experience, and this is what I think. And, you know, but the thing is, like, you're saying, no, but this is what the word of God says. This is hard to say right here, but this is what God has for us. And to walk them through that. The truth has to be central, not your good opinions. And number three is mutual accountability. Authority given to others who hold us accountable to mutually agreeable standards. So as Jesus would tell people to follow me, he was accountable to that. People would follow him and they would trust him. And Jesus would hold his responsibility as teacher. Paul was you know, mutually uh, accountable as well. Pray for me. And he would tell them the reasons why to pray for me. You know, but also he would ask that from those that followed him as well. Transparency and honesty and truth. So here we go. Here's my example. Can you please open up to the book of Luke chapter 5? And as you open up your scriptures, let me give you some context real quick. Number one, Jesus is a method of reaching out to people. He used teaching 61 times. So his methodology of teaching, 61 times. That's it. Preaching. Preaching was mentioned about 30 times in the gospel. Now, preaching is proclaiming the gospel. It's, it's, hey, everybody, I want you all to hear. And teaching is like, hey, I want you to understand. So once again, teaching 61 times, preaching 30 times, and coming in at number three is reclining at the table having a meal with somebody. And Jesus did this 23 times in the Gospels. He did this so much. It says in Luke chapter 7, verse 34, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I love Jesus. And one of the reasons why is because he wasn't just a skinny twig just walking around as we see in our art depictions all the time. Jesus might have a gut. I don't know. I I hope, but we'll see. 
But Jesus ate so much that they called him a glutton. Jesus drank so much that he called him a drunkard. These are accusations, of course. But he used his methodology so much because there was such an impact on the people that he was eating with, that he was breaking bread with, as we'll continue to see. So he uses the table as a means of connection. Now, one more thing before we jump into our story here. You have to understand the cultural context at that time and why Jesus was so revolutionary. Because once again, rabbis would, would lean more towards a Pharisaic culture, meaning that they followed the law. There were there's certain steps you had to take in order to not only be a rabbi, which is very difficult, but even to be part of the community of believers. There are certain things, certain standards of ways of life that you had to live in order to do that. And so according to them, first, you have to behave. If I use our, if I use our current context, I would say, don't drink, don't smoke, you know, don't cuss. But back in that day, it's, you know, dress well, right? Don't act a fool. Don't have a bad reputation amongst the community. Because if you do, there ain't no way you're going to come in here because you're weird. So once again, the first way is first behave. The second portion is this, is then believe. It's not just believe anything out there, but believe what our rabbis say. Believe what we talk about. Because if you don't agree with our rabbi, if you don't agree with our community, then go find a different rabbi, go find a different community and get out of here. And if you want to push back on our rabbi for whatever reason, you're not welcome here at all. And you need to believe like yesterday. So behave, believe. And if you do these things and if you prove yourself and if you come from a family that has already done this and you don't bring shame to them for whatever reason, you can be part of this community. You can belong. Now we come to our, our character here named Levi. And you have to understand some things before we once again get into this story. You understand the culture. But also now you understand there's a man named Levi, and he was named after the Levites. The Levites were the priests that ministered to all of Israel. And you can imagine the day that he's born, his mommy and his daddy are just holding him one at a time. <laughs> They're holding him. They're like, what do we name him? Let's name him Levi with the idea and the hope that he too will minister to Israel, that he'll live up to the name of priest. But the thing is, is that we see that Levi is a tax collector, and that's a huge no-no. And, and very simply is this, is that Rome would require Israel to pay a certain amount for taxes. And he, they would use Israelites to go and tax their own people. Now, what these Israelites would do is, if Rome is requiring $10, they would say, Rome is requiring $15. And so they would give Rome what belonged to Rome and then hold to the extra to themselves. So they would cheat the people. And so as we see Levi, he's cheating the people as a tax collector. He's not living up to his name, but also he's walking knowing that he's letting his community down and he's letting his family down. So what I'm trying to build right here for you as we jump into this story here is that Levi is in a dark place. Levi is in an isolated place with no hope. But then we get to chapter 5, verse 27 through 32. And it says this, After he, Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. He used that rabbinic language. I believe you can do what I can do. Follow me. Verse 28, and leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others. Some translations would say, and sinners. Now, the thing is, they would emphasize this because there may have been people that did so many shameful things that it, it, you, I don't want to write out what they've done. So lots of tax collectors and sinners. But look at this, reclining at the table with him. So 
in America, we have tables just like this. And as you sit down, there's some distance and you can, you know, eat and you got your fork and your knife. And you're like, ha, 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 very delicious, very good. But back in that ancient day, the table was even lower. They didn't have chairs to sit on. And so what Jesus would do, he was recline on people and lean on people, including tax collectors and others. And at that time, they didn't have forks and spoons, but usually people would eat communally from the same plate and get that shawarma or that chicken or that steak or whatever it may be and using their hands like, oh, they're so good, right? You can see how Jesus was so personable and he was reclining. He was at peace. He was at comfort being at the table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. So once again, the Pharisaic model was this, behave, believe, and then you can belong. But as we see in this context right here, Jesus said, look, first you're going to belong. You're welcome here. I am with you. I'll recline with you. I'll break bread with you. And you're going to come to believe. Now, I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to twist your arm. I, I'm not going to tell you, hey, believe in me now or else. No, he says, look, you're going to come to believe. And after that, you'll come to behave. So you might believe in Jesus. You might cuss a little. Jesus is like, I'm more concerned with your heart. You might believe in Jesus, but you might struggle with doubt. Jesus says, you can still belong. I'm still after your heart. So what do you think of Jesus' model? Once again, not trying to corner them, not trying to force them to be his disciples, but belonging, breaking bread, having that relationship with them. So Jesus' model of making disciples takes time. It's not a one and done it's not passing a test and be like, okay, you got 100%. Now you can follow me. No, he says, hey, it's going to take time. It's going to take multiple meals. It's going to take years. It's going to take weeks. It's going to take time, but you are worth it. And who you're going to become will be worth it. Jesus' model of reaching out to others doesn't demand that they change and get cleaned up first. Jesus' model, model requires us to listen. To be a non-anxious presence. So what is the first step right here to making disciples? The first step is relationship. I love what a man from a church call, uh, told me. He said this. He said, Epi, you first have to make friends before you make followers. They have to have, build up trust in you. They have to know that you're a safe place. They have to know that if they come to you with doubts or worries, or fears, or even confessions that you won't chastise them, and you won't beat them over the head with the Bible, like, I can't believe you did that again. Like, they had to know that what you even had to say is trustworthy, and it comes from the Word of God and not from your good opinions. It comes from the Word of God and not from a sermon that you heard 10 years ago. They had to know that they're being invested in by someone who loves them as Jesus loves them, and is patient with them, as Jesus desires for us to be patient. Now, the second part of how to make a disciple, and here's just a suggestion. Relationship is huge. I would say relationship is needed primary number one, but vision is needed. Once again, what Jesus are you talking about? And we're gonna get more into this in our next lesson. But what Jesus is so compelling that you're like, yes, I want to follow him. But not that only that, but like imagine a life and give him a vision of a life. Because the vision that we normally give in the evangelical world is this. Come to Jesus tonight and you can be in heaven. You never know when you're going to die. So you'll get to heaven. And so you get this get out of hell ticket. But that doesn't require transformation. That doesn't require a vision. That doesn't require even sacrifice on them because they're like, I got my ticket. I prayed this prayer. I'm good to go. And they wait years upon years living in dysfunction or, or being that person in the gym, not knowing how to use the weights and all that, not knowing what is available to them. 
So you need to give him a vision of not only of who Jesus is, but the life that he offers that involves identity and purpose. So let's get into it. What changes desire? What will change somebody from wanting sin and craving sin or craving unhealthy coping mechanisms and all that? It's vision. Vision changes desire. When you have a shift of some sort, it's because a vision captures you. Vision is critical. And here's here's a fun one just to add on. Vision is what leaks the most. You can tell that person who they'll become. You can tell that person all about Jesus, but in a couple minutes, an hour, or the next day, they'll forget. Oh, yeah, yeah, you said that one thing. Oh, yeah, 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 but this one thing has really hit me really hard, you know, life and all that. Vision leaks. So what is my idea of Jesus? When we're evangelizing to people, we're giving them the vision of Christ, and we need to have something so compelling once again that they want. Jesus. So vision can be used to create disciples. And so I have a a little model here for you real quick. Any form of transformation that occurred in your life, VIM is used. VIM stands for vision. Vision is accurate vision of who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and self. And we get the proper vision of Jesus through the Gospels. So once again, we have to give the proper vision of who Jesus is. He is not a Republican, (laughs) gun-loving, you know, person on the sides of the street saying, you're going to hell, like, ah, Chuck Norris. He's he's not like that. But we see his character and his heart and his love through the Gospels. We need to have an accurate vision of who God is. The second part of them is intention, the will to act. Vision fuels intention. And lastly, is means, means practices, exercises, and habits. So let me give you an example. Look at this picture here. The Olympics. A young girl watching the Olympics is, it is her first time watching the gymnastics team, and it, she's memorized. She turned to her mom and said, I want to be in the Olympics. That's her vision. That little girl caught a vision, and when vision is sparks, it fuels intention. The little girl pestered her mom every day and let her to let her become a gymnast. Intention is that intentionality to do something about that vision. She had a vision and the drive through intention, but she lacked means. She needed classes, magazines, leotards, etc. So as we talk about vision here or vim. If you want to be a Christ follower, if you want to be a disciple and you want to say, God, I want to be the husband that you desire me to be. What does that look like? I want to pray with my wife every day. I, I want to take her on spiritual retreats, let's say, right? I want to wash her feet. I, I, I want to be close to her. I want to be safe for her. Okay, let's say that you're younger. What's your vision? I want to be used by God. How? And it might be unique to whatever you are or whatever you're doing, but let's just say that you want to be a missionary. I want to be a a missionary. My intention, I will do what it takes to study. I will do what it takes to build the character of Christ. And the means now, the means is, okay, I'm going to start doing fundraising. All right, I'm going to start meeting with different coaches and different mentors or get discipled by somebody else. Vision, intention, means. So vim in churches. People in church are lacking true vision of who Jesus is. If their vision of Jesus is lacking or is a bad vision, it affects their intention. So if Jesus is only good for the get out of hell ticket, I don't want to be like him. Like, I just want to be where he's at. I'm not really wanting to be in relationship with Jesus. We have to give that proper vision. Low intention will produce actions based off of self-righteousness. So for example, to be that missionary and you're like, my intention is to be the most holy. So I'm going to fast every single day for a year. Good luck with that. Right. And, and I'm going to judge other people based upon what I do. And if they're not doing what I'm doing, then ah, it's based on the self-righteousness. The church tends to focus on the means, but not focus on the vision. So there's lots of churches out there that focus on the practical side. 
read your Bible, pray. We can just throw that out generally. What's the vision of reading the Bible? What's the vision of praying? What's the vision of evangelizing? Like, what's the why to this? And then also, what's the means to this? How can I practically go and make disciples? How can I practically now go and evangelize in a healthy way, in a biblical way? How can I go and do this according to Scripture? Give them that vision. Help them with the intention and provide the means. And allow them to take that ownership, that responsibility to go live in a vision bigger than themselves. Let's move on. So the four primary roles embodied in Jesus Christ is revealed in Scripture. Number one, we see him as Lord. Have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into your life? Now, the word Lord is a title. It's not Jesus' first name. It's a title, and it means master. And so Lord and Savior language will not help someone grow in faith. Have you made Jesus your Lord and Savior? Get your ticket. You're good to go. Okay. Jesus as Lord was great language in the first century because it spoke of Jesus as the true master and not Caesar. And we tend to view the word Lord in a transcendent way. We need to be a certain way. The word Lord went against Roman culture. That's why they use that so many times. Another role that we see Jesus as is Savior, which is true. He saved the world. He, he, he went to the cross for us. But look at this. Jesus is the Messiah. This language was for the early church to see that Jesus was the atonement for mankind. Presently, so much of the gospel we preach is based on our sinfulness. And we continue to bash us and we continue to bash our neighbors about their sinfulness. And you need the Savior, the Savior. And it's all he's good for. He's just the lamb that was slain and there's no need for a relationship. He, he, he saved us. We're good to go. He brought us to shore. We're saved. These top two titles are prominent in the evangelical world. And if we focus so much on our sinfulness and guilt and shame, then discipleship will never be produced. If you continue to beat yourselves up to seeing how bad you are as a parent or a spouse or even as a follower or a disciple, discipleship won't be had because you'd be like, why even try? I keep screwing up. So we move on. Another role Jesus has is teacher. This is a role Jesus needs to take on in our lives every single day. He needs to guide us in every situation. The moment that the disciples followed Jesus, he was their rabbi. And so once again, we have to understand that Jesus is our teacher even today. And he can teach us so many things. To turn to him for mathematics, to turn to him for science and biology, to turn to him for practical reasons of how to run a company, to turn to him when you need help changing a tire or, or fixing the toilet, whatever it may be, to turn to Jesus as teacher. I know it sounds weird as I say that out loud, but that's what he calls us to do is to be a disciple. But last one is this, and a lot of people might abuse this and a lot of people might not keep this in their vernacular, but Jesus and his role is to be a friend. Jesus introduced this term before he went to the cross. A friend is not a buddy. A good friend is someone who shares the real stuff with you and you with them having full disclosure. Jesus doesn't desire for you to come in some fancy language and some clean garb. He desires for you to come to him personally and intimately and genuinely and authentically saying, Jesus, I, I miss you today, man. Jesus, I'm struggling with this. And, and you can imagine Jesus is sitting with you like, I'm here. I'm willing to listen. And I'm willing to talk. So all these are important visions of Jesus. But once again, if we only had the vision of Jesus as Lord, it's fear-based and will not mature into discipleship. To attain the true vision of who Jesus is takes time and not canned presentations of the gospel. Because if we do that, it will lose steam over time and it won't lead to discipleship. So how do people in church view Jesus? What is their vision? Now, there was a study done by Fuller, and this was probably 10 years ago. 
and they interviewed 500 teenagers. And as they did that, they asked certain questions of who is God to you? What is God's role, et cetera? And so out of interviewing all 500 of those students and calculating all those questions, they boiled down to who God is to that younger generation. And they boiled it down to three different words. And the three different words are this. It's moralistic, therapeutic, deism. Now, moralistic, it means basically these students, the majority of them, viewed God as, all right, God, where's the boundaries? You know, where's the line? You know, how far can I get to the line without falling over? And, you know, I'm really struggling with with drinking right now because I I don't know if I want to get drunk. Like, Is it okay to get drunk? But, like, after that, they don't talk to God for a long time until, once again, there's another moral issue. Other students continue to talk about therapeutic. They turn to God when they need something emotionally. Like, God, like, I broke up with my girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever, or, you know, I, I did this, and, you know, and you start, like, just, like, verbally vomiting on Jesus, and you're like, oh, I just, blah, 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 and I'm just struggling, I'm just so depressed, blah, blah, blah. Oh, all done, you know, and, and they leave. Like, that's what Jesus is good for. He, he's therapeutic. But they don't wait for him to speak back. But here's the last one, which is big. Deism. Deism is a belief that there's a higher power and that there is a God, but this this deity just watches from time to time, but he's so distant and so far away. So when it comes to Jesus, a lot of these teenagers, once again, would go for him to say, is it okay to do this? Like, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to go to hell. Therapeutic. I just want to talk to somebody. Deism. But you're so far away. I don't know why I'm even sharing this with you. It just goes up into the empty air. But as we read this gospel, it's like, isn't Jesus more than that? Like, isn't his character more appealing than that? Once again, we're going to get into that in our next session. But here's a question I need you to hold on to and think about real quick. What is your vision of Jesus? What is your vision of God? And I hope that this really pushes you right here to see and look at, like, I I never really asked myself about that. What is my vision of Jesus? Now, as you ask yourself these questions, I hope it pushes you right here to say, all right, yeah, who is Jesus to me? Like, what is this vision of Jesus? What is his character? Why do I want to be that? Why do I want to be Christ-like? And why do I want to make others like Christ? Like, is your vision of God big enough? That truth and grace can be comprehended in the hardest of situations. Like, is your God big enough for that? Is your vision of God big enough that when he says that he forgives you, that you actually trust him enough to say, I believe you, that you do forgive me? Is your vision of God big enough that when God says love, is your vision big enough, once again, to trust him, love your enemies. Ooh, that's hard, but it's God asking. Okay, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to take that step. I love it. It is one. I remember driving by this one church one time, and it had a the billboard where you can change the signs, and it said, "A God small enough for you to understand is not big enough for your problems." rhetorical question is your god small enough to understand or is he greater and mightier and bigger not only to take care of your problems but something you want to imitate in your life as well look at this quote it says people don't change by facts they change by stories the church doesn't need someone telling facts but to be living a story and that story is living within the vision of what scripture says about Jesus. So what changes people's view of God is changing abstract thinking into reality. So let me end with these two quotes right here by Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi was known as a Buddhist and he was a peacemaker, but he's accredited for two quotes that have rocked my world as a Christian that have made me think again about like, man, am I doing it right? And am I really living for Jesus? And he said, Jesus I like, 
But his Christians, I don't. And the reason being is because Christians, once again, weren't living according to what Jesus taught, which led to his second quote. He said, if only Christians would live according to the teachings of Jesus, then we'd all be Christians. Wow. As a disciple maker, it's not about giving trivial knowledge and trivial facts. It's not about helping that person stop cussing or stop sinning. The goal of a disciple maker as we build a relationship and as we give vision is to help them become more like Jesus. That's our goal. Because the world is watching and that disciple that you are discipling can go and multiply just like Jesus' early disciples and turn this world upside down. Hopefully not after their own image, but once again, if you did a great job, after their Christ-like image. Amen? So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. And I ask you, God, that you'll bless these students as they chew on these questions and even wonder about how big and grand you are. So Lord, I pray that you'll present them with time to meditate and think upon your character and your love. Allow them time in your gospels, Lord, to be reinvigorated, Lord, with, with the love and passion of Jesus. And also I pray, Lord, for divine opportunity that these students here, Lord, would be led to disciple someone. Even if it comes to mind right now, or Father, through a divine opportunity, whenever you choose, help us, Lord, to walk out this life and to live it as you desire us to live it. In Jesus' name, amen.